Thus say amen again. Amen. Let us all say praise God. Praise God. Let us all say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now you realize some of you have said amen, praise God, and hallelujah, and still do not have a smile on your face. <laughs> Nothing that even resembles a smile. So I'm going to have them come and sing one, one more song. Uh, uh, one of your brothers, because uh, Brother Garrett, I, I, I thought that uh, David Ruffins didn't have any other relatives until you got up there and just started singing. Amen. So it doesn't matter which one of these brothers or all three of these brothers just come up here and sing one more song. Uh, their choice, of course. I'm not going to be like my, my colleague and tell you what to sing yet. Amen. All right, here we go. We're going to try the song that we did last week. More than able, okay? So here's all the bass right here. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's my able. God is more than able. Said he's, he's able. able. He's able, he's able, he's able. My God is more than able. One more time. He's able, he's able, he's able, he's able. Yeah. My God is more than able. I said he's able, he's able, he's able. He's able. My God is more than able. Feel 
If you've ever had a prayer that you thought was not going to be answered, if you ever had a burden that you thought would never be lifted, if you had a, ever had a chance that you thought you would never get, then you know that God is real. Because he's able to bless us when others say that we cannot be blessed. He's able to lift burdens that others find too heavy. And most of all, he is a God who has answered prayer. If you have had God answer prayer, say amen. amen. I asked you a few weeks ago, it might be a month ago now, to begin praying for our leaders. I'm going to get you that challenge again. The last time I talked about the elders, but this is the way we're going to do it this time. For this week, if you are in this section, say hey. hey. I want you to pray for the ministers. If you are in this section, somebody say, watch out there now. Watch out there now. I want you to pray for the deacons. And if you are in this section and the sensibilities allow you to do so, I want you to say, yeah. yeah. I want you to pray for the elders. So let's see if you remember. In this section, you are praying for. In this section, you are. And in this section, you are. And we're going to be praying for everyone because we're most fortunate to have leaders in a time both in the church and outside of the church where we often do not have those who lead us. Be finding, if you will, Mark, the second chapter. We had verse 1 through 12 read in your hearing. We are this morning going to be focusing on verses 1 through 5. And tonight, we're going to be wrestling with that idea of how do you hold on to your cure while holding off your critics. Many of us have been through some stuff. And we need to figure out how we are able to both hold on to the strides we've made while at the, the same time holding off our critics. But this morning, we're looking at Mark, the second chapter, and focusing particularly on verse 1 through 5, and we're going to reread it in your hearing. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no room not even at the door. Is that in your Bible? And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above them. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. My son, your sins are forgiven. Her name was Jo Kite. And for years she specialized in teaching people how to swim. Usually teaching adults how to swim who were afraid to learn how to swim. Now she never had a failure rate that I can recall. Except for one person. You know him as Brother David Holmes. It's not that I was afraid to learn how to swim. Well, maybe just a little bit, just a tiny bit. But it was just that swimming to me sent out mixed messages. You know what I mean. On the one hand, swimming ends up working all the muscles of your body. On the other hand, if you try too hard, you will slow down. On the one hand, swimming is about you depending upon the buoyancy of the water. But on the other hand, if all you do is just float, you might stop floating, might not move, and for those of you who have a lot of muscle, you might even sink. It sent mixed messages to me. I've been in the church long enough, and many of you have been in the church long enough, to know that sometimes, no matter how we don't want to admit it on Sunday, our Mondays and Fridays become such a burden that we realize that faith can sometimes send us mixed messages. I mean, on the one hand, you find in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that the just shall live by faith. Paul will go on in Romans to suggest that faith seems to be all that really matters, and then we go to James chapter 2, verse 26, where the Bible says faith without works is dead. And for those of you who do not know the Lord, and for those of you who are coming to know the Lord, and for all of us who are struggling with knowing the Lord, faith can be confusing. Faith can be confusing when you've done all that you can do 
to be a good steward of your money and the bottom falls out of your finances. Faith can be confusing. When you try to eat as healthy as you can only to have the doctor tell, tell you that the test results are not good. Faith can be confusing when you try to be a faithful spouse only to find out that for years your husband or your wife has been stepping out on you. What we need more than anything else is not so much clarity of faith because I got news for you in case you missed it, bad things happen to good people. What we need is not so much a clarity about faith, but what we need is a clear connection with a Jesus who can make a difference. This morning, we're reminded from the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is the one who makes the difference. The key passage in the Gospel of Mark is chapter 10, verse 45, where it says, Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I've got to connect with a higher being. We call that being God. And I've got to connect with a higher purpose. And that higher purpose is serving someone else. And there's very few places in the Gospel of Mark where we see both that higher calling of serving others and that higher connection than we see in this passage. In fact, in some ways, don't, don't get offended when I say this, this is a party passage. Well, why do you say this is a party passage, Brother Holm? Because somebody was raising the roof. Somebody, somebody knows back during their Motown times when it was time to raise the roof. And a matter of fact, some of you are, are, are old enough to even uh, go back to the platter times when they raised the roof. And some of you are old enough to even go back to the ink spots when they raised the roof. And somehow, in some way, I don't know about you, but when I confront some of my challenges, and the challenges are new, aren't they? The challenges that I'm going to confront that some of you know much better than I, that I'm going to confront as I hit 60 and 70 and that I don't have a clue about, those are going to be new challenges to me. Am I right about it? Some of you can testify about, Brother Holmes, I, I thought my health was going to be great, then I faced this new challenge. I thought my finances were going to be all right. A am I I'm speaking to you directly? The challenges are going to be new. But thank God, with new challenges come new mercies. Because somewhere I read, the steadfast of the Lord, love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies, they never come to an end. They are new every morning. And I have to tell you that I'm not looking forward to the things that come with aging. I'm not looking forward to the challenges that necessarily come. But if I have to face those challenges, it's nice to know that I have a God who has new mercies. I, I, I can't do those day-old, stale mercies. I, I can't do those one-day bread mercies. I'm going to get some brand new mercies for everything that I face and for everything that you face. So this sermon is for folk who are going through some stuff. If you're not going through some stuff, you have my permission to go to sleep. Some of you are already doing that. <laughs> but if you're going through some su stuff, I want you to walk with me as we look at a life-changing, situation-altering faith that raises the roof. And if you notice, there's a, a, a not too good of a picture, but this gives you a picture of somebody breaking into those roofs. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if you're going to have a roof-raising faith, the first thing you have to do is understand your focus. And that is to focus on Christ instead of the crisis. Focus on Christ instead of the crisis. I, I don't know about you, but every now and then I look back uh, when I was younger and I, and I think about some things that I cried about that were not actually crises. Uh, do you know about that? Some of us were cry babies uh, crying about things that were not actually crises. You cried about that guy who did not ask you to prom. Help me, somebody. You cried about that promotion you didn't get but actually didn't deserve. Some of the things we cry about are not actually crisis. But make no mistake about it. What you struggle with, I may not struggle with. What I struggle with, you may not struggle with. And every now and then we have to understand that there are some cries that become crises. Uh, if, if I had this printed out like the way I should have, these are all name tags, and it says, hello, my name is. Can you relate to this? Hello, my name is stress. Hello, my name is grief. Hello, my name is anxiety. Hello, my name is depression. Hello, my name is frustrated or shame. You may or may not have a cry 
that becomes a crisis, but left to its own devices, without the Lord, your stress can become anxiety, and your anxiety can become frustration. Is this not why the Bible teaches us in Proverbs chapter 3? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Something that might be a problem right now might become an emergency later on. That's why husbands, talk to your wife. Don't just grunt. Don't, don't just, uh, when she hands you a, a plate of ribs at the super, uh, when the Super Bowl's on TV, say thank you. Don't just grunt. Because what becomes a grunt right now uh, can become, I want to divorce you later on. Amen? Focus on Christ, not the crisis. And isn't it amazing that even those things that we consider to be emergencies, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to belittle or minimize anything that somebody might be going through today. If you're going through it, you're going through it. But I want you, I want you to see this and understand what's going on in this text. In this text, we have a man who didn't have a HMO. In this text, we have a man who didn't have Obamacare. Uh, I've got to tell you that sometimes all of us, myself included, get upset about health problems and the cost of health care, and I understand that that's a serious problem, but they didn't have any health care back here. So anything that they went through was magnified. Can you see this man? But somehow, in some way, even though he was a paralytic, and let me just take a minute, say, take a minute, Brother Holmes, to, to describe what a paralytic was. In, in those days, we're talking about somebody who could have been quadriplegic, we're talking about someone who could have had just one side of their, uh, their themselves immobile. But I, I know that there are some people, even in this audience, who are from the waist down immobile, who cannot walk the way they used to walk before their head was whitened with the snow of many winters. But, but, but they walked once upon a time. But can you imagine from the neck down being immobile? You see, uh, the problem in Mark chapter 1 was that the leper could not be touched. But the challenge in this text is that a, power, a paralytic cannot touch anyone. Can you imagine not being able to hold someone's hand? Can you imagine someone not being able to hold your hand? This person was in a helpless situation. And I want to tell you today that if you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, you are in a spiritual crippled situation. You're not able to reach out to God the way you need to or reach out to your fellow man the way you must. You are struggling just a little bit. This was a helpless situation. This was a helpless situation. And because he was in a helpless situation, he was also hopeless. Notice the Bible doesn't say that this man was always crippled, that he was always a paralytic. Once upon a time, he could probably remember the touch of his daughter's hand. Once upon a time, he could probably remember doing something basic like dressing himself. Isn't it amazing what we take for granted? And that's a message for those of us who are young. That's a message for those of us who still have the use of our limbs. While we can do, we should do. While we can write notes to those who are being discouraged, let us write those notes now. While we can take our feet to walk and visit folks, let us do that now. Because you never know when you might not be able to walk. We never know what a disease, how a disease will creep up upon us and take over us. But here's what I love about this passage. Even though this man appears to be helpless and hopeless, have you ever felt hopelessness? Have you ever felt like there's no one who understands what you're going through? Can I be real with you? Uh, even though you know that God loves you and will take care of you, have you ever wondered, God, why are you waiting so long to get this straight? Why am I waiting so long to get a job? Why am I waiting so long to get a spot? Why is it taking so long, Lord? That's the kind of stuff you don't say in Sunday school. That's the kind of stuff you don't say at a, at a fellowship when you're eating down on that greasy chicken, praise God. But that is reality. All of us at some time feel hopeless. But the good news was, he had uh, some friends. He had the Bill Withers philosophy, or, or his friends rather, had the Bill Withers philosophy, lean on me when you're not strong, and I will help you to carry on. 
the Bible lets us know that he had some friends who believed that they could get through the crisis. Notice where Jesus is at this point, and you'll understand better about how you, you don't have to focus on anything but Christ during the crisis. The Bible says that he had returned home. That's what the text says. So it is either his home, or some scholars think it might be that he's returning to Peter and Andrew's home. And the way those, those houses were set up, there was a staircase on the outside so that you could climb up to the rooftop. And that rooftop was flat. Somebody say flat. And that rooftop had logs on it. And then those logs were, were covered with straw and other kinds of things. And then they were eventually either covered with mud or they were covered with mud plates or tiles that were made. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because Jesus had been to that house before. And Jesus got away to pray. Now, leaders, let me tell you this. If Jesus had to leave the folk sometime and go and pray, if Jesus had to be by himself to pray, lead us, you need to go pray. And, and, and if I could be so bold, and I, maybe I shouldn't say this, you would tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong, and you would tell me if I'm wrong. Wives of leaders, tell your husband to get out the house and go pray sometime because it's important. Jesus went away to pray. Now, I want you to watch this text closely. When he returned to this house, because of his reputation, it was so crowded that these men could not get in through the front door. And we'll talk about the, overcoming the crowd in a second, but I want you to understand, there is no crisis that should be so hopeless that you don't look to Jesus to help you through the crisis. There is nothing so hopeless that we do not look to Jesus to help crisis. But now watch this. The Bible says he had four friends.
have not raised their heart to God. Amen? Just because you have a lot of enthusiasm, don't get me wrong, I'm, 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 I'm coming back. There's going to be a part two to this. Don't y'all get excited, get nervous. But just because you're getting excited doesn't mean you have really dedicated your life to the Lord. Y'all looking at me funny. How many of you, uh, how many of you sisters remember the one that got away? The guy who dated you that got away and you are so thankful to the Lord that he got away? Boy, he was so enthusiastic about how he loved you. Started giving you lies that you know weren't from him. I, I know I'm not the best looking brother in the world, but I do believe in love and I do believe you and I can make it. Didn't even have a job. This is what we have to be very careful about. If someone is, is expressive because they are expressive, that's one thing. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily sincere. Y'all ready for the part two? Uh, here's the part two. Just because you sit quiet and holy don't mean you're quiet and holy. Well, that's, that is beneath my dignity to shout. Well, don't shout then. Ain't nobody trying to make you shout. But just because you don't want to shout, don't stop those of us who want to shout. Amen. Yes, yeah, sir. Somebody, somebody said to me uh, kind of in a friendly way, uh, 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 David, I thought you were a professor. I am. Thought you have been a professor for a long time. I am. And so, so you get excited and you're standing up in the pulpit. And your point is, <laughs> but the point is, what we see in a crowd is not necessarily spiritual. Y'all looking at me funny. Do you remember in Mark chapter 5 when there was a woman with an issue of blood? For 12 years, 12 long years, she had a hemorrhage and she wasn't being touched as well. But then she somehow snaked her way through the crowd. She somehow eased on down the road and she put her hands on Jesus because she thought, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, that's a sermon in itself, 12 years a slave, right? If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. But now watch this. There was a crowd around Jesus, a multitude is typically 5,000 plus. Am I right about it? Jesus said, who touched me? 5,000 folks that Jesus said, who touched me? You, you know why? Because there is the press of the crowd and there is the finger of faith. You see, sometimes we're worried about crowd. Jesus ain't worried about no crowd. Don't, don't get me wrong, we're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. And that means ugly people too because it's every creature. Amen. We're supposed to preach God to, to every creature. Reach out to those funny looking people too. Yes, we're supposed to uh, uh, be a, a part of our community and, and, and reach out to this community so that everyone knows the unsearchable riches of Christ, but don't get it twisted. Jesus was not seeking a crowd. Crowds came because he served. Those of you in my Bible class this morning, close your ears. You heard this illustration already. It's going to be fresh to those who didn't hear it. Now, sisters, if there were a sale on some very expensive shoes and they were 95% out off, do you think anybody would have to advertise that? No. Hats. Fancy hats. 99.9% .9 off. You think somebody had to advertise that? Because there's a need that is being met. Rather than focusing on a crowd for crowd's sake, which Jesus never did, he focused on serving people. And so in Mark chapter 1, there's a crowd. He has to leave and retreat to pray. By the time you get back to Mark chapter 2, that crowd is back. Because whenever you are serving someone, that's where the crowd comes. But now watch this. Not only did these, these uh, folks have a faith that raised the roof because they weren't worried about the crisis, they weren't worried about the crowd. You don't know who's in here and why. Rewind, David. Okay. You don't know who's in here or why. Jesus understood that in the crowd, you have some people, somebody say some people, who want to come to Jesus. In a crowd, you have some people who are just curious. And I'm not going to make a commitment. That's the problem with some of the Christians. Hello, in the church, they're, not wanna, they're just curious. And then there's other people who are critical. And I'm a firm believer in constructive criticism. But just as I don't believe in crowds for crowds' sakes, I don't believe in criticism for criticism's sake. Just like some of my colleagues who teach college who think, well, if they have a lot of people who fail, they're a good teacher. No, 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 no. You're not, you're not a good teacher because everybody failed. So it is with criticism. Anybody and their mama, I'm not talking about your mama. 
Anybody in their mama can criticize someone. And sometimes we mean it to be constructively, but it is destructive. Notice the crowd, they weren't concerned about that. Can you watch them? Usually people who are paralyzed are sick in any way. Sick in any way. Were considered to be sick. Watch this. And you know this from John chapter 9. If somebody was sick, somebody say somebody. If somebody was sick, it was usually considered that they were sick because of their, their sin or their parents' sin or they were being tested by Satan. Their sin, their parents' sins are tested by Satan. So can you see him? Can you see him on this homemade pallet? Can you see him, the paralytic, not being able to move at all from the neck down? Perhaps the only thing that could move on his body are his eyes. And can you see him as he looks around? Can you see him as he has to trust someone else? You know one of the reasons why we need church? You know one of the reasons why we need fellowship? It's because in order to learn how to trust God, sometimes you got to trust somebody else. You got to trust somebody else. That's why the Bible says if we cannot love one another, if we cannot put up with one another, we cannot love God. Have you learned to trust someone else? Brother Holmes, I don't know. I don't know about those elders. I don't know about those deacons. And I definitely don't know about you. Man, I, I just, I, I really don't know. Matter of fact, I know so little about you and, and, and who you are that I, I'm wondering just what little I'm picking up, how your wife even married you. Right? But we have to learn to trust someone. And this man learns to trust someone. Let me ask you a question. Who do you trust this morning? If not the elders, which the Bible says are the shepherds of our souls, mine included, if not the elders who shepherd, if not the deacons who serve, if not the preachers who preach, if not the song ministry staff who guides us to pray, if you don't trust them, who do you trust? Hello? I, don't, I like singing, okay? I don't like the shepherding, okay? I definitely don't like the preaching when it's Brother Hawkins coming back. <laughs> who do you trust? Because God has sent to us people in our lives. And if we cannot learn to trust them, we can't learn to trust God. Are you here for the crowd? Listen, come to the crowd for fellowship. Express yourself to be connected with God. Because ultimately we will not stand before God as the Figueroa Church of Christ. Ultimately we are going to stand before God as individuals. As much as I love my wife, I'm not going to stand before God for her. I'm going to stand before God for me. Which is why the Hebrew writer says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. And faith will never raise the roof until, number one, I focus on Christ instead of my crisis. That the, there ain't no mountain high enough. Uh, there is no valley wide enough. There is no river deep enough to keep me away from the Lord. So that has to be our challenge as well. But not only... Must we focus on Christ and not the crowd? Not only must we focus on Christ and not the crisis, but the very last thing we must remember is we must focus on Christ and not decline. Can you see the picture? Can you see them having to carry this paralytic on a pallet and then climb up some stairs? Are, are you watching it? Climbing up some stairs. I told you stairs were on the outside. Somebody say on the outside. On the outside of the house, and they, they climb up on the outside of that house, but first of all, they have to muscle their way through a crowd. You ever been at a Black Friday sale? They have to elbow somebody. Yeah, I know y'all Christians, but you need to confess right now, you elbowed somebody during Black Friday. But are you willing to give what it takes to get what you need from the Lord? Let me say that again. The, the crisis is what I'm going through. The climb is how I get through it. And sometimes we get the crisis or the cure mixed up with the climb. Let me say that again. Sometimes we get the crisis or the cure mixed up with the climb. There are some people in here who have been married for 60 years. Let's just do this. If you've been married more than 50 years, raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. If you've been married more than 50 years, raise your hand. Brother Shepherd, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Uh, if, if you've been married, you, you put your hands down. If you've been married more than 40 years, raise your hand. More than 30? More than 20. So all you folk who've been married all these years, above 20 years, 
You have always felt like being married to your spouse. Your spouse has never gotten on your nerves. But what newlyweds tend to do, right, is they come to you and they say, you've been married for 30 or 40 years. Oh, my goodness. You must really love each other. You say, yeah, you got that right. It's, it's just like the, the man who says, smiles and says, I do. As Jack Evans says, he's going to be doing a whole lot more than he think he's going to do <laughs> if he stays married. And so it is for us as well. We're going to have to climb. They had to climb stairs through a crowd. What do you have to climb? Maybe you have to climb your sense of entitlement. Lord, I've been in the church all these years. I shouldn't be having these problems. You ever hear people say that? Come on now. Maybe your climb is your own self-entitlement. Maybe your climb is your own selfishness. You know, you want to get out of your own problems a little bit, get out of your head a little bit. Spend some time serving someone else. Because if you serve someone else enough, it's very difficult for you to just focus on your problems. So can you watch them? They're climbing up, elbowing through the crowd. They're climbing up the ladder, and then they get on the top of that roof. And I told you those roofs were made out of uh, branches and thatch and mud, and they break through the roof. Now, if I might quote that eminent scholar, Deacon Cecil Godbolt. This is an audacious faith to break through a roof. Now, again, we don't know whether it was Andrew or Peter or somebody else's house, but that's a lot of nerves. Are you willing to break the rules to see Jesus? Are you willing to do something that seems unconventional or revolutionary to follow Jesus? Once upon a time, there was a man who had a vision. You know him as R.N. Hogan. And for those days that he started his ministry, he was breaking the rules. Didn't violate scripture, but he broke the rules. He received criticism from some who didn't know better about singing groups, especially singing groups that would sing out, uh, out in City Hall during Christmas time. He, he received uh, a criticism for uh, having a flag because we only know that when it comes to the restoration tradition, only the Christian church does that. And I might as well just go on, step out there. Say, go on, step out, David, step out. Go on out there, David. He was criticized for having women ushers. Revolutionary in his thinking. But if he were here now, he would say that we have a new revolution. We must never leave the scripture wide. Because every word of God is pure, and he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be find a liar. We must never leave the word of God. Why? 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. He has given us all things. Not just some things. He has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. We have everything we need in the word of God. Make no mistake about it. We must preach the word of God as the word of God to a new generation, to people who may not have an attention span as long as you have to people who may not know the word of God as well as you do. In short, we need to stay with the word of God, but we need a 2.0 vision. We need a revised vision for a different kind of group of people. That's how faith breaks through the roof. I'll say this and I'm done. What about your personal life? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired spiritually? Are you sick and tired of not being able to, to work through your spirituality like you need to? Have you been promising yourself for years that th this is my year, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year, and, and I'm going to be on, this is my, are you tired of that? It's like the people who go on and died in January, and by January 31st, they're off. Is that where your spiritual life is? If you're sick and tired of being sick and tired spiritually, if you want a faith that breaks through the roof, man, make a suggestion, get some friends. Get some people who you know are serious about the word of God and the work of God. And if you get some friends, I guarantee you that you will see your faith lifting. You, you might be paralyzed when it comes to Bible study. 
but you'll see your legs strengthening. You, you might be paralyzed when it comes to visiting or sending people's cards, but you're going to see that being strengthened. There are some people in here I know who wouldn't mind helping you along the way. So stop complaining and start reaching out to the people you know at this congregation who are willing to be those people who hold you up. I don't know about you, but there are some points in my life where I need somebody to hold my palate up. I need to be able to lean on someone because I'm not strong in every area, just as you are not strong in every area. But do you have the courage to reach out to someone to make you more of a giant spiritually than you are now? I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I'm ready. Turn to your other neighbor and say, right now, I'm going to be able to look at someone and say, I need you to help build me up in this area. That's the nature of fellowship. Yesterday at our zone meeting, I was scared to death. I was scared to death because Sister King has some questions that she wanted us to answer on a sheet of paper about the Bible and bones. I said it, the Bible and bones. And Kenny, I was afraid because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to answer that for all those five questions. And how embarrassing would that be not to be able to answer those five questions being a preacher and all. But, but fortunately, there were a couple of us who were able to answer those questions, and guess what? She said, well, wh why don't we do some makeup questions? I said, never mind. <laughs> because sometimes we're afraid to be vulnerable. But it's only in those close contacts, those close contacts, whether we're talking about the zones or other opportunities where we're close together, where we'll be able to become vulnerable. Because if you do not become vulnerable, your faith will never break the roof. This morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a child of God, if you're not a member of God's family, you haven't become vulnerable. You haven't heard that story how Jesus died, buried, and rose again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You haven't heard that that story is one that must produce in us belief that there's somebody, his name is Jesus, who can save us and take us to a point that we cannot take ourselves. If you've heard that story, you, you know that it's not just enough to have this mental ascent, this mental knowledge of who Jesus is, because a lot of people have that mental knowledge, but that must lead you to a place where you say, I'm tired of sin, and I'm going to turn around. But then you're going to have to be a people that, having confessed the name of Christ, you are baptized for the remission of your sins. Why? Because we're vulnerable. You need to come. We invite you to come to be a part of God's family, or maybe... Having invited you to become a part of God's family, there's another invitation. If you are now sick and tired of not being spiritual, come forward, have us pray for you, and I guarantee you that somebody in here is going to reach out to you, and if they don't reach out to you, you reach out to them. And by the way, I think I speak for the elders and the ministers when I say, if you ever respond to the invitation and someone looks down on you, let the elders or the ministers know because ain't nobody got any business looking down on anybody for anything. Woo! We're here to build each other up. Amen? If you need to come, won't you come as together we stand and sing. Somebody's knocking at your door. Well, somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody, somebody is knocking at your door. Somebody, somebody is knocking at your door. 